good morning, everybody. I'm Shalmili Aydur, and I'm part of Dasra's research team. Keeping with today's theme of sustainable and inclusive development, our next panel, From Margins to Mainstream, emphasizes this key principle with a focus on intellectual and development disabilities, or IDDs. This sector is a relatively new sector for Dasra, and I know it sounds very technical, so I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to go through the definitions that are up on the screen. To also summarize, for those of you uh, who this, this subject may be a bit new to, um, our research addresses four main disabilities. Autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, and multiple disabilities. So I'm sure as we start this topic, some of you may be thinking, why IDD and why today? I'd like all of us to take a step back and think of all the times that we've been in crowded public places. It could be a mall, a railway station, or even a park on a Sunday. And I want you to think back on how often have you encountered a person with intellectual or developmental disability? The answer is very, very rarely, I'm sure. And hence, we believe that it's time that we ask ourselves this question. Why have we created public spaces that have forced people with IDDs to withdraw from them? Why are persons with IDDs so invisible to others? Hence, we believe that this research is going to change that narrative and is our first step at doing so. During our research, one thing um, that shocked us the most was that in India, persons with IDDs are so overlooked that we do not have an accurate figure of the number of people with such disabilities in the country. We do have estimates. But these estimates are wide-ranging, from about 1 million to 3 million. Another important fact that shocked us again was that exclusion begins at the age of 3. Moment children with intellectual and development disability are segregated from mainstream schools and taught in special schools. Seeing that we do have laws in place, for persons with disability. However, in practice, India has left, and repeatedly so, have left persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities out of our growth story. While all of this sounds a little dire, let's not forget change begins one step at a time. So through this report, we analyzed each life stage from birth to education, to employment, and even living in the community. We spoke to experts and identified four priority areas of action that can create catalytic impact. We have that here in front of you today, and it's also detailed out in our report. The first area of birth and early childhood so the human brain experiences 75% of its growth between the ages of zero and five years of age. And hence it's crucial to strengthen timely identification and early intervention services. The next is to ensure quality education by equipping educators with the right tools and techniques. Financial independence and agency are important factors of adult life. And there is an urgent need to create these inclusive workspaces for people with intellectual and developmental disability. Lastly, we all live in communities. And it is very important for our communities to be inclusive to ensure holistic support for these individuals and it can only be achieved through sensitization and advocacy. Um, one thing that I would like to share with you all today is the most heartening aspect of our research, 
with being able to travel the length and breadth of the country from Meghalaya to Andhra Pradesh, from Pondicherry to Delhi, and have the privilege of speaking with people who are working tirelessly on the ground, day in and day out, to create change. Organizations such as Umid, Jaivakil Foundation, RMKM, Latika Roy Foundation, Vidya Sagar, IICP, are all doing great work in their communities and beyond. Um, our report highlights the models and approaches of 10 such outstanding organizations. Um, so we started this day talking about partnerships, sustainable and inclusive partnerships that can be created and have the potential to create catalytic impact. Speaking of that and looking at that session, our partnership with Bank of America, I believe, has created such catalytic impact. We have had the honor and privilege of working with Kaku and her team at Bank of America for many years now. Each year, Kaku and her team help us bring out the best of our research by strategically questioning and going through our findings with a fine tooth comb. They push us to ask ourselves how we can do better and we do better. <laughs> so Bank of America has spread beyond the boundaries of conventional CSR channels to fund and support un traditionally underserved sectors. And we would like to thank you for that. Uh, the, this year, Bank of America, along with Dasra, has chosen to shine the spotlight and support yet another underserved sector. And that too through our report, Count Me In, Building an Inclusive Ecosystem for Persons with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. So without further ado, I would like to call the team of Bank of America on stage to launch the report. Thank you, Kaku. Thank you, Neha. Um, with that, we're now going to start our very interesting panel. And I would like to call on stage our panelists. Though they need no introduction, let's begin with Jija Ghosh. Jija was born with cerebral palsy and was a part and has been a part of the disabled people's movement for more than two decades. She has recently started an organization called the Inclusion in Fine Foundation with some like-minded friends. In 2009, in recognition for her invaluable contribution, she, she received the Role Model Award from the Office of the Disability Commissioner of West Bengal. Our next round panelist is Dr. Vibha Krishnamurthy, who will also be moderating the panel. She's a developmental pediatrician and the founder of Umid Child Development Center in Mumbai. We also have today Shai Venkatraman. Shai is the editor and news of Net News Hook, India's first accessible news website for people with disabilities in Indian Sign Language. And lastly, of course, we also have Kaku Nakate, the president and country head of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and it's super exciting to be here this morning on the stage on Women's Day with three incredibly powerful women. Um, really happy to be part of this team. I hope over the next uh, few minutes for us to uh, talk about the importance of the issue that we're discussing and uh, some of the issues facing 
those of us who work in the space, those of us who are stakeholders in other ways, and, uh, way, and the way forward in terms of what we want to do in this space. Um, I'm going to begin with saying a few words about, um, because I have permission as moderator to say some stuff myself, apparently. Yeah. So um, what I want to say is um, that the numbers look small if you look at the official numbers, right? We look at the census of India and it says 2%. And um, I do want to call out that that's a gross underrepresentation. In fact, it is wrong because the census happened when um, the Persons with Disabilities Act included very few disabilities. Yeah. It was six at that time. There are 22 now, right, Jija? And um, 21 right now. And I think um, what is important for us to understand is that this is not a small niche issue. It's something that affects all of us very profoundly and personally. The reason is every one of us is going to have a disability at some point in our lives. If you count disability as the inability to participate in life in some way, in the world around you, um, that is one. Being interested in childhood disability, I know that I have the figures for childhood prevalence of disability. And it's not 2%, it's 15% closer to 15%, we're talking about one in six. And why does that look so disparate? Because when we think of disability, what do you think of when you think of disability? You think of a person in a wheelchair, you're thinking of someone with a hearing aid, you're thinking of someone with a stick because he has visual impairment. But when I think of childhood disability, I'm thinking about the child who has intellectual disability, which is not visible, I'm thinking of autism, which is not visible overtly, I'm thinking of the child with learning disabilities, with attention deficit disorder, that kid who's speaking late. So when I include all of that, think of your kids, think of their classrooms. Think of a classroom of 40, would you not expect six kids to be struggling? And I think that is really what we need to keep in mind because this is the workforce of the future. And if we are not addressing this issue now, it, it involves every single one of us, professional and personal lives. Um, so with that, I'm going to begin with asking Jija a little bit about her thoughts on inclusion. Um, you know, Jija, I think one of the things for me is um, inclusion seems like a destination for people. And they say, we must be an inclusive society. Or we need to have more inclusive schools. And I've always thought it's more of a process rather than a destination. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about inclusion, what you feel about um, it personally, what it has meant for you. Oh, you have your mic, sorry. Um, and Jija, you want to go with the slides? Yeah. Okay. Mm. How can I? Well, me, in, 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 but if I participate in protest, we recognize that somebody who is a part of protest can do it respecting one another. We are all diverse. So we have to accept and respect we, and we talk about a term while this is reasonable accommodation. This means that we provide those changes in the environment or attitudes which will make the other person comfortable. It's not only about disability. If you see 
nebhat of it. It's about life in general. And, and we all need the opportunity. Unless we get the opportunity, how will you know? How will we express our ability? What I'm capable of. So that is, and one thing I believe is charity that it helps. I give to win chair with somebody. I do a bit of social work. I'm happy. But what that that person benefit in terms of psychological satisfaction? So, Jija, thank yes. you so much yes. for that because you've said something that I think has been on a lot of our minds about um, looking at a charity model yes. uh, as far as persons with disability is concerned yes. is more, um, it's actually demeaning and yes. uh, it's about looking at whether you're giving equal opportunity yes. and giving them an opportunity to see uh, where they fit in and where they can contribute. Uh, I think I also really enjoyed what you said to me outside when we were talking, yeah. that it is, um, there are two kinds of things that people think of. And the most common thing is infrastructure. Let's do ramps, let's give out wheelchairs, let's provide hearing aids. Um, but I think what's more critical is attitudes. Attitude. And attitudes of inclusion, each one, you know, taking the effort to get to yeah. know someone, uh, giving them the opportunities that they need. Do you, Deja, would you say a little bit about your personal experience with that? Yeah. And I was telling you outside from my high school, I went to a mint school where there was no infrastructure. I had Climb up on the third floor. But what was amazing was the attitude. And by attitude, I don't mean pity or sympathy. I was treated as if. Well, I was one of the girls in the class. And, and so uh, you were treated as equal in the high school that yeah. you went to where there wasn't significant infrastructure. In mm. fact, you had to walk up three flights of stairs. Yeah. But uh, it was just the attitude of the teachers and the students. Uh, what I also mean I was not overworked. Overworked a low big fast. I was just one of the students. So, so truly the spirit of yes. Countess and you weren't overprotected or treated with kid yes. gloves, but you were just one of the kids. Yes. And which is really what you wanted. Yes. Jija, since we're talking about schools, we're talking about teachers, we're talking about students in schools, would you say something about other stakeholders do you think need to be involved in this? Other stakeholders definitely the parents. Okay, move to the next slide. No. Definitely. The, so, the stakeholders is everybody. The entire society, person with disabilities, 
So, you know, looking at the stakeholders we put out here, yeah. it's, it's pretty much anyone who comes into contact yeah. with people. Right? Would. Um, and and uh, Jija, I like to think of it as two tracks sometimes. On one track is those who are deeply invested. So yeah. we have our, you know, the persons with but disabilities, the children, is. the parents, the, uh, you know, the it teachers, is. special well, educators, yeah. therapists. But on the other track are, you know, policy makers, well, uh, yeah. people in general, um, and corporates, yeah. uh, offices. So I'm, I'm taking that over to Kaku to ask a little bit about um, Bank of America's interest in this space and how did this happen? And I've heard a little bit about the U.S. and some of the work that BOA has been doing there. Uh, would you share with us your experiences there and maybe extrapolate a little bit on what you think the corporate sector's role should be uh, in this space? Good morning. Happy Women's Day to everybody. Uh, and I would just say that uh, thanks for all the men who are supporting us here. <laughs> so coming to your question, really, I think Bank of America has been promoting inclusive growth across the communities where we operate because it's very important for our communities to feel that we are part and parcel not only to make business revenues, but actually contribute to the growth and the environment around that. So we have been, uh, you know, doing inclusive growth on many other parameters. So we started with gender, of course, and then we went to LGBT, and now disability has been a focus for the last few years in the rest of the world. But in Americas, we've been doing phenomenal work on recognizing all kinds of disabilities, physical as well as intellectual. So what we have done in US is taken a cohort of around 300 people with different kinds of disabilities and created four centers across America specifically in different parts and tried to create an environment specifically for them where they don't feel neglected. They have the aids, visual aids, support systems, services, where they feel that you know they can enhance their careers. And we sp spend a lot of uh, you know, time, not just money, on creating those tools. And we've seen phenomenal results, and we have been adding people through that. Of course, even in our other branches, we have people because, you know, you are <clears throat> a part of the community. So that part is there, but this special exercise has actually given us phenomenal results. Coming to the second thing that we have been doing is we've been partnering for 15 years with Skookum where actually in our facilities managers and things where we know that they can really be helpful, we have insisted that certain targets be met and they become a part of the cohort. Including in India, we have worked with Sodexo to create that. And we are all creating awareness amongst our own people because it's not just to employ, it's to make, as she said, very, very comfortable that they feel a part of us and a part of our own team. Just recruiting them for the heck of recruitment can really actually go vice versa and people will not really feel. So a lot of awareness campaigns are being run. There's a lot of volunteering being done. And finally, we've been sponsoring for years together Special Olympics in the US so that, you know, that is the best thing to help them achieve goals because all of us learn through sports. So to your point, 
a lot of work has been doing, and I think as corporates, it's our duty to actually create this environment where every individual has a right to actually exceed their potential and recognize that everybody cannot be judged on the same performance parameters that each one are judged. Thank you so much, Kaku. I'm going to add uh, to that a little bit. I want to check um, in on what you heard from people about what it's done to the persons without disability. Like what's in it for them, quite honestly? What happens to the other people in the office when you're including persons with disabilities in the office? Because at the end of the day, it's your personal experience that drives how you act and how you feel about an issue. Uh, I grew up with an uncle with intellectual disability and a first cousin with autism. Uh, I have a lived experience of what it feels like to have persons with disabilities in my family. So I'm curious to hear what it did to other people in the office. I think the biggest thing is compassion. You can't have a workplace where you are just competing all the time. You need to be aware. It brings in compassion. It also improves your other side of your life. Balance in life is very important. If you really see when our father, parents really grew up, if I may say, they used to have a lot of community being. They had time for that. And you could see them after 536, you know, spending that time. Now, everybody's in the rat race. Everybody is actually looking at mobiles all the time. So this also improves a lot of communication skill. It also improves compassion. It also helps you deal with different inclusive skills. I actually think that even we as a person benefit. And it's not only that the person benefits. Uh, and it's really interesting because if you look at the data from schools, uh, schools where there is inclusion, and most of this data, unfortunately, is from the US, they actually saw improved academic scores where school systems had a conscious um, effort towards including students with special needs. And there is a hypothesis around uh, why this happens. But I think the most uh, common um, uh, feeling is that when you teach to the most vulnerable, you make things better for everybody. And, um, and I think that's uh, really how um, I'd like us to maybe look at the workspace as well. Um, Shai, tell us a little bit about um, your journey into working with Newshook. Uh, when I last met you, you were with NDTV. Uh, you were covering actually the terrorist attacks and we were doing a workshop related yes. to that and that's when I first yeah. met you. And since then, our um, connection has been in different ways. Uh, my team is super excited that I'm talking to you because of Newshook. So tell us about Newshook and your journey there. So Newshook is, uh, I have it on time. So Newshook, as you know, is, uh, is a barrier break initiative. And a barrier break works in the field of accessible uh, technology. And uh, there was a need felt to have a space where disability-related issues got a, a complete focus. Because there is so much happening in terms of parasports, technologies, uh, workspace inclusion, schools. There is a, I mean, the problem though is in the mainstream media, it gets reflected when things go wrong, when there's an atrocity, or you have a leader who says something really terrible, right? So then it becomes an issue. But otherwise, there's no dedicated space telling you about, say, a policy, or what your rights are as a parent of a child with a disability in school, or the fact that companies are meant to have policies, or what you can demand, or what you can go ask for, Simple things, how do you prepare for an interview? Do you state your disability at the outset? Or do you want to say it later? And if you do, how do you state it in a way that doesn't make it look like, oh, well, you know, I have this, but to say, look, if you give this to me, or these technologies, this is how I can do my job. So there were these queries people were asking, and we felt that we needed to create a space. So I covered public health. The terror attack was one of those things you get dragged into as a TV journalist. But uh, my focus really was public health. And when this opportunity came up, I have to say, I felt a little ashamed when I thought about how in all my years of public health, really, in, and it's true for me, mainstream media even today, disability doesn't really get looked at. We don't look at the issues around disability. We don't look at enabling or empowering the community or really talking about you know, the day-to-day -day issues which affect us like we do for in so many things. So. Uh, but have, I was not an expert. I had 
not, you know, within the, f in the field of disability. I didn't, so I was a little wary, I'll be honest. I said, will I be able to do justice to this? But honestly, I think it's perhaps, I mean, I, I've, uh, I, really, I really enjoy this. And I think it's great to get the feedback we do from the community. We don't always get things right. Uh, people get upset with us say, about some terms that we use, don't say autistic, say autism, don't say hearing impaired, say deaf. I mean, so, but there is, the, there is a politics, and initially I have to, like I told you, it was a little intimidating because we said, oh God, we're not getting this right, and we don't mean to do this. The idea is to really reflect the community's concerns. And so, but it's, I think over the years, our readership has grown. We have people reaching out to us, uh, you know, sharing their stories, and there's some, I hate, you know, like Gigi was mentioning, not pity or charity. I hate to use the word incredible. It's incredible that they did this. It's inspiring that they did this. I think that in itself is also a certain prism we view the community from. The fact is, we are all different in many ways. And like uh, Kaku said, the idea is to respect those differences and to see every, those as strengths. So, but it's been, it's also been, uh, I think it's emerging and it's, it's a space where I think uh, people come to, and I, the idea really is to make it an inclusive space. It's not that, oh, if it's a person with a disability who read it, it's for everybody. We have news, I think, that affects all of us, and it should. So. Thank you, Shai, and thank you for sharing with us candidly, you know, what some of the challenges are. You know, should we be politically correct? Should it be um, person with autism, or should it be autistic person? And what's been interesting for me is that, um, people have different choices, just like you and I have different choices about how we want to be addressed. So do persons with disabilities have different choices about how they want to be addressed? And it's best to ask them, uh, what, ask the individual what they would prefer, right? And um, at the beginning of this, I was told to tell people that write in your questions through the app. And um, one of the things that Akshita mentioned to me was, uh, we want to make sure that there are no insensitive questions. And, you know, well, it's good to have insensitive questions because people are insensitive only when they haven't been sensitized. And that's what we're here for. And, um, and so bring him on. And um, as, as far as um, one of the things that Shai said about connecting people with what's out there with policy, what, yeah. what are, what's really available to us. Um, Jija, would you share with us a little bit about policy and where we are at with that? Could we have the slides back up, please? Thank you. Policy, we see a lot gap between policy and practice. In India, I think we are good at making laws. We are good at saving us, but putting them into practice is a different matter. We also come to the politics. We all know we have had the 
So it's interesting, Jija, like in a lot of other matters, we yes. have some good laws. Yes. Uh, the Persons with Disabilities Act in 1995, thereafter the amendment. Um, and I know that the disabled persons lobby worked hard on it. Yes. Um, all of us worked hard on it yes. and it finally was passed. But the key is the slip between the cup and the lip in terms of the yeah. law and the implementation yeah. and despite the, the law saying that we needed to have states develop rules for implementation uh, within six months it's been several years uh, over six years and mm. 2016 to now oh, so Two so two years and we still haven't had yeah. more than one third of the states uh, yeah. make any kind of rules related uh, to implementation, yeah. which is, you know, yeah. Shai, that brings us to how aware are people of the issues around disability. You know, there's a World Bank report on persons with disabilities in India from 2007. And uh, I remember being struck by this figure um, that when they went to the homes of persons with disabilities and uh, asked families and persons themselves, how many of them knew about the Persons with Disabilities Act 1995? I believe the number was 4%, right? So uh, when you're so busy surviving from day to day, figuring out what you need to do to go to school, to get a job, to um, you know, go to the market, be part of a recreational group, uh, attend a concert, it's really hard to think about what does the law say and is it being implemented. Um, so, uh, Shai, what are your thoughts about attitudes of people with disabilities and what have you learned through your work with Muso? I think one of the big uh, walls that uh, people with disabilities still face is the stigma, you know, within families, within the larger community. We just profiled, in fact, a young woman uh, from a small village in Punjab who talked about how in her growing up years, she'd glaucoma and she lost a lot of her vision and she was told repeatedly how the only thing she's gonna be fit for is domestic work. And she said, though I had supportive parents, there was this reaction every time they would try and get me to learn something, send me to a school, 
So I think that is still a very real factor in rural, um, it's even semi-urban areas where you forget this, is, uh, you know, even within the immediate family, there is a lot of stigma, there's this superstition about this. So, but I think the RPWD, the w word about the RPWD has gotten out. Yes, like Jija said, states have failed on this count, most states. I think Delhi is one of the few which, is, which seems to be going about it, going about implementing it with real purpose in the sense they've had meetings with schools, they're trying to do something about the infrastructure, but in all the other states, even Maharashtra notified it very, very late last year, hasn't really gone about doing it in very, any serious heart or purpose, and that is a problem. But I think the disability uh, community, the rights community in many states, in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, even Maharashtra has been pretty proactive. They've been going to homes, they're bringing out regional language copies of the act. So there is that happening, but it is a vast community. And you know, it, it, it's not, it's painfully slow, I would say this. And I think you come across that particularly in schools at that first level where there are so many barriers to being, you know, being a part of a mainstream classroom. And so I don't want to sound really so dark and gloomy. I feel it's better. I think particularly in the metros, in the more urban areas, there is growing awareness. I think parents are going out much more and talking about it, forming support groups, communities. So that's very heartening. But I think we, in, in, in the smaller towns and cities is where the challenge really lies. I'm not sure much has really changed there in many parts of India. So I think it's, it's probably as we are moving on and wrapping up, I'd really love for us to spend a few minutes reflecting on where do we go from here? I mean, we are different representatives here. I come from Umid, a not-for-profit that works with children with disabilities, and our focus has been reaching scale through capacity building and training people to create skills to work with children with disabilities. Uh, but apart from that, what are your thoughts, Kaku? What are your thoughts about uh, what is the way forward? What's the collective action we need to take as a group, apart from be here and talk about it, which I think is the first uh, place to begin? Lots of work needs to be done in this, and best practices need to be shared. So I think collaborative platforms can be really useful in the interventions, because you know you need special talent to also work with the people to get them to their potential. And it has to be, as you mentioned, if the problem itself is not identified to the extent it should have been known. We can actually have platforms of that. I would say also age-wise, you could think differently. Because most of India's population, if you see, the intervention, if we increase in the, as per the Dasara report that we worked out, between zero to five years, then, you know, that is a cohort where IQ, you know, the initial initiation that you need, habits, et cetera, could be well, you know, trained. So the impact could be reduced substantially and a positive thinking could be created. And malnutrition is the other, where we can actually make good food available to many of the young children. Because the statistics that I saw when we did the report was 12% of children do suffer from neurological you know, disability issues. And that is one section I think can be easily, you know, got grant money for children, can be identified. And then corporates, we also have to play a role. We can depend on public, power, uh, you know, public-private partnership, but I really feel the states, in my opinion, have failed to create that environment that they should have. And I don't see them rather than using this more as a vote bank. Um, thank you so much for bringing that up, Kaku, and I think that's uh, spot on in terms of our need to invest early um, to, in order to re leverage the early years of life when we can create maximum impact in growing brains. Uh, Jija, any last thoughts about um, impact and the way forward? Way forward, I shot and I, I feel it needs a collaborative approach. No one group can do it. We need all the stakeholders. We need parents, we need community 
So right on that, uh, Jija, I think it's so fabulous that here we are sitting together, corporate, uh, media, uh, not-for-profit sector, and BPOs working together uh, to make this visible to all the people over here. And with that, I'm leading into uh, the Q&A section. Um, can we open it up to the audience? Akshita, would you like to give me questions? And um, I'd also be really happy if folks just want to uh, raise your hands, and uh, I see a hand right there. Um, do you want to begin uh, with the person there? Uh, yes. If they can have a mic. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, this is an extremely amazing panel, and I would like to congratulate Dasra on hosting a panel where you have actually been inclusive on the panel. Good job, Dasra, on that. Uh, as a father of a person with a very rare genetic condition which manifests in physical disability, only about 90,000 cases globally as extreme as my son, uh, I agree to the point that I hear on the panel that it's about collective action. But I also find it slightly hypocritical when we all sit as members of the not-for-profit or development world uh, that what Shai said, we glorify the collective action, but when it comes to our individual action in our own organizations, in our own setup of employing or bringing people on board with disabilities, we kind of move on to glorification of America Merrill Lynch or Lemon Tree Hotels or others, but we don't get in there ourselves. We say we might not have the right resources to bring people with disabilities on board or make our own organizations inclusive. Mm -hmm. So just to break it very simple and make it simple, can the panelists have one recommendation each on how can I, with a three-member organization of my own or a 30-member organization of my own, make it more inclusive without really making it more overwhelming for me or making it glorified for someone else? Jija, do you want to begin with that? Um, Darshan, thank you so much for that question. And yeah. it's, it actually really resonates because I think uh, the questions we have from other people in the audience also have asked on, you know, what can we do on an everyday basis to create this inclusive environment? And um, I, uh, Jija, why don't you go first? Uh, on our part, we do love and when we go to the training, we tell the people, even if you go back home, and then to more people, what you have heard, like you are standing in the world. So, um, Jija, what you're saying is yeah. each person who hears about yeah. the importance and the relevance of inclusion yeah. today goes back and talks to his or her immediate circle, and yeah. that itself is, does a great job that of spreading awareness. A, a good job. And one thing I feel sometimes people feel Oh, this group is always demanding. They want this, they want that. But if there another person who is not a member of the group talk about it, I think sometimes and make a Good impact. Thank you so much, uh, Jija. I think uh, each one, bring one, uh, used to be the policy, I think, for one of the schools in Delhi where they had a support group for parents of kids with special needs. And they said, this is great. You have a wonderful support group. But now bring one person who has a kid without a disability and let them into this group and have them talk about it. Um, uh, Kaku, you want to add uh, one recommendation for what we can do in our everyday lives to make our environment more inclusive, um, keeping that right balance between uh, being sensitive and helpful and not charitable. And I actually wanted to contest 
glorifying is important. It's not bad because there is no awareness in the subject itself. So I do think sometimes glorifying at least brings awareness. People want to talk about it. That's the first step for them to really recognize the problem. And at least at the corporate world, I can say, including in India, we have a disability you know, promotion network, which we call Disability Advocacy Network, DAN. And we have programs running to really create awareness. And it's about all disabilities, not necessarily only IDD, but um, the change that we have seen for real life people like Jija coming, say for example, we've had a blind trader coming, we've got somebody from intellectual disability, and the awareness has really <clears throat> led to volunteering. And now I do find some of our people willing to go and volunteer some hours with those institutions like NGOs, because it does require, as you said, a lot of love and care and different interventions for them to meet. And we have just started the journey, but I think all of us can spread it, at least at the corporate world, first the recognition, and second, people who are compassionate, give them time out and give them flexibility of work out so that they can do this at least for a couple of hours in a week, itself will be a big contribution. Fabulous. Shai, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it would, I think I would say uh, start at home, start with the people around you, your children, your family. I mean, I've heard some really uh, blanket statements made by close family members. And earlier I would, you know, s I, now I very vehemently tell them why not. I mean, I'm not saying you should get preachy about it. That's not the idea. But I think you should correct those stereotypes and you know the comments that everyone feels so free to make. I think you should start there. And I think as the editor of Newshook, I would say I really look at Newshook. I mean, I, I think the, the idea is to give the tools to fight, because I think it's a fight. I think in this country, given the barriers that the community faces in terms of totally, you know, the policy, at the policy level, there's such apathy. There are so many infrastructure barriers. The idea, that pushback, that thing of, no, I'm going to ask, I'm going to stand up and ask for it, has to come from the community. And I see Newshook, I mean, that's my aim really with Newshook, is to give those tools, to say, no, you have this, you have that, you have this technology. And I want to add one thing, one of, one, what gives me, gives me great joy is to see the, that there are so many young engineers, a lot of young people coming up with assistive techs for people with disabilities, across disability types. And they're all really young, they're in their 20s, some of them are college students, and that to me is incredible. Not all of them have a disability. So it's, I think there is a change, and I think that's happening. And I, the I, Newshook really aims to say that, no, I mean, we are here, we count. Don't think we need your pity or we need to, you need to make an exception for us. Thank you so, so much, Shai. I want to end with sharing a personal experience. Um, I had uh, children from uh, my son's school when he was in second grade come visit our center, uh, Umid, um, and spend a morning with the kids. And initially, uh, they were really scared. Um, I found them all clustering with each other and whispering to each other. But then we allotted them one child to another child, right? And they found that each of those kids could paint, could play ball, like to be tickled. Um, there were things they could do. They discovered cool things about each other got to know them, and by the end of the day, um, my collateral as a parent had gone up. My son's friends thought he was pretty lucky to have a mom who worked in a place like this because it was so much fun. And, um, and I think it's really about just that. Each one get to know one, and once you get to know a person, uh, that changes your perspective on disabilities because it's very, very personal at the end of the day. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists so much for this uh, wonderful discussion and the audience for uh, being a part of it. Thank you.